If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. When we talk about this theory of the thermal mix robot, the same thing we want to apply to the produce that we start producing initially. And that is, we need to have produce that have been well tested in the technology that we're using and with the right recipe. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ag tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 8, regular listeners, welcome back. I appreciate you taking time out of your precious day to listen to these stories from inspiring folks that I'm connecting with in the world of vertical farming. And if this is your first time listening, then I'm positive you're in the right place. This is the show where we interview fascinating CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from around the world. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed last week's episode, we had a great conversation with Daphne Proust, the founder and CEO of Carbon Book. It's a topic we don't touch on regularly here, but it was an important conversation around reducing carbon emissions in the vertical farming space, some tips on sustainable agriculture, and specifically for farms, learning how to manage carbon footprints and exploring available opportunities in this industry. Check that out if you haven't done so already. This episode, I get to speak to Marcos Enriquez, the founder of Issy Farmer. Marcos focuses on the challenges and opportunities of their Issy Farmer platform, whose goal it is to provide fresh, healthy, and locally grown produce to consumers in urban areas. Marcos talks about his partnerships with suppliers and the need to train farmers to ensure consistent quality in their projects. He shares his vision for expanding his business and scaling it in different cities and places where he's finding a demand for locally grown produce. It's an interesting conversation where we learn about the specific initiatives that Marcos is working on with the city of Malaga in Spain. And I think it'll be helpful for others who are trying to build those partnerships with the decision makers in these cities as well. If you are enjoying this episode or any of our past episodes, I'd love it if you leave a rating or review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. I'd love to read yours out next. These episodes are always chock full of great takeaways. And as a listener, I want you to always focus all your energy on our conversation. Rest assured, you can always visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com and you'll be able to read the full show notes for each episode, which will include all the guest links mentioned as well. Okay, before we jump into this uninterrupted conversation with Marcos, here are a few words from the folks that support this show and to whom I am eternally grateful. This year, Vertifarm takes place from September 26th through September 28th at the Exhibition Center in Dortmund, Germany. For those new to Vertifarm, it's the most significant trade fair for next level farming and new food systems. Their international platform is set to showcase the latest developments in innovative controlled production systems for vegetables, salad crops, herbs, and microgreens, as well as sustainable fish, insect breeding, fruit cultivation, and medicinal plants. Vertifarm is shaping the future of vertical farming and new food systems. Reserve your ticket and learn more at vertifarm.de. That's V-E-R-T-I-F-A-R-M dot D-E. This year, Indoor Ag Tech is coming to New York City's Times Square, and it's bringing together the world's leading growers, retailers, tech providers, seed companies, and investors. Join us from June 29th to June 30th to meet, expand networks, and produce fruitful partnerships. The team has been gracious enough to provide listeners of this show with an additional 10% off of the registration. Simply use promo code VFP when you register and lock that in. And by the way, if you're on the fence, remember that early bird discount ends on May 11th. After a pivotal year for CEA, the summit will explore what's needed to ensure the industry can continue innovating and growing into a crucial part of the global agri-food supply chain. So Marcos Enriquez, founder at Issy Farmer, thank you for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you, Harry. Do you remember how we crossed paths or how you heard of the show? I've been hearing you for a while. It seems like I know you very well from way back, especially during COVID. I've been listening a lot about you. lately even more, because there seems to be a lot of things that join us in uh, certain ways. And one of them is 
We're doing some consulting work for the city of Malaga in Madrid, in, uh, in Spain, I'm sorry. And the city of Malaga is competing against Minneapolis for the uh, Expo, International Expo in 2027. Oh, okay. So we want to share with Malaga how vertical farming could be the center of that sustainable city. And uh, doing the research, I find that Minneapolis is also a candidate for this expo. And uh, you living in Minneapolis, I was like, wow, you know, how coincidence, you know. Yeah, it was interesting because I, I'm recently here. I've been here for, I think, going on four years. I moved here in 2019, but I, re I grew up in New York. I was born in El Salvador, so <laughs> I came here when I was a year old. So it's been interesting. And I've lived also in L.A. for four years prior to, to Minneapolis. So I've experienced the big cities and now getting a taste of what life is like here in the Midwest. But I think I did remember hearing something about that. Do you know when they're going to be making a decision on that? Well, I know there's another voting process coming up in June. So I'm not sure if that's the final one or if that's going to two or, or, or three cities. Right now, there's five candidates. And, you know, Malaga is rooting for it really bad. But the mayor is also saying, you know, whatever we're doing for the sustainable city, it will persist whether we get elected or not. So it makes a lot of sense what they're doing there. How many cities are being considered? It's five right now. One, I think, is Bariloche in, in Argentina. Then you have Belgrade in Serbia, Phuket in Thailand, Malaga in Spain, and Minneapolis in the U.S. Interesting. So <laughs> very wide variety of, of uh, cities all over. Do you know how that process works? Do they usually start to eliminate them one by one so that you're left with four, then three, then two? Is that how it works? Something like that, but what I've read mostly is that all the cities that pertain to the alliance vote in one vote. So, like for example, uh, we consider Spain to be closer to the Latin American company, countries, and being that there's a lot of them there, it would be great if Argentina wasn't part of it, because mostly we're thinking they will probably vote for, for Argentina. Again, it's a very maybe political voting process because a lot of people don't really look into the actual program that each one of them is presenting, right? Okay. So talk to me a little bit about your history with vertical farming. You mentioned you were listening to the podcast, but what was happening, maybe to rewind it back a little bit more, like how did you first start to get involved? Well, let me tell you the whole process. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started uh, several different companies. Actually, most of them or my obsession for the sharing economy. My first portal was, it had several different services. One of them was to upload uh, games and uh, jokes, all that stuff at that time. We were all sharing via email. We created a site so that we empowered the user to actually upload the content. They also had a chat area where they could actually buy credits to be the owner of a chat session, and they would choose what type of content or who would join. After that, I built an audiovisual platform, very similar to YouTube, and allowed the user to upload videos and monetize them. After that, I started a ranking.com, which was the voter's choice that would make the best product or service. Also, in, I traveled to Mexico for a while. I started there uh, my app, which was a site or an application that would allow the user to be a concierge. Actually, this was professional people that uh, wanted to sell either tickets or hotel reservations or whatever, and they would get a commission based on that. So you see, most of the apps that, and programs that I've made were related to the sharing economy. The latest probably was a blockchain company that I built to do the traceability of vegetables from seed to plate. And that didn't really have too much involved with sharing, but I did manage to see that there was a big, big problem with all the agri-food supply chain from start to finish. And that made me look into it a lot further. How far along did you get with that, the blockchain project? I got five or six different clients. And the main problem there was that some of them told us, okay, I want this product to show up in blockchain because that's, you know, you can't change it after it's, it's uploaded that information. And it says, 
but not this other product. I don't want this other product to show up. And I was like, why not? You know, what's the problem? And doing the investigation and the due diligence on that, we found out that a lot of farmers are cutting, not farmers, but the whole chain, they're cutting corners and they're looking into how to make the most money or how to get by the different regulations that they are. So for me, it was a breaking point figuring out that with blockchain, I was not going to be able to solve this problem. But doing the due diligence with some of the companies, I found out that uh, there was the, the hydroponic system and seeing how, you know, you can create crops anywhere, you can cultivate anywhere. I figured, you know, okay, instead of the seed and seeing what to do, let's take the seed over to this point where it's being consumed and let's see if there's enough technology to to solve that issue and to cultivate directly at the place. And this is when we figured out that there was enough technology to cultivate anywhere. So we did a minimal viable product and we started cultivating just about anywhere we could. I even brought uh, home a couple of hydroponic systems and I figured, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. And that's when it came to me that sharing economy, this would be the best example of a sharing economy that what I can figure out is if I can get anybody to cultivate in the middle of the city and we can create the platform to join the producer with the consumer. And this is where we're standing. That's Easy Farmer. It's a platform of urban farmers that we're going to create the, the software and all the needed elements to join the producer with the consumer and we're starting right here in Madrid doing a 400 square meter co-working urban farming platform so that urban farmers we can teach them show them how to do it and even guide them directly through in the same warehouse that we're all at at the same time. So talk to me a little bit about the setup and what's your definition of urban farmers and then how the platform actually works and is this for individual people in their homes who are going to be wanting to do this? Or are you partnering with supermarkets and farms that can grow on a larger scale? Well, as you can see, the vision is to join the growers with the consumers. But where to start? Right now, we are choosing Madrid and a co-working area where we can feed about 10 urban farmers. And what we define as an urban farmer right now it's actually anybody that we can teach them how to produce, but we've decided to focus mainly on fruit and vegetables distributors in Madrid. They already exist. They're already serving different restaurants and different hotels with uh, high quality products in Madrid. And most of them try to get local products and local is within a hundred kilometers around Madrid, obviously, because you can't be producing in the middle of the city. But we've chosen some of these and what we want them is to start producing in our co-working space so that they can distribute those products, which are not obviously all that they're taking to their clients. We decided to start with uh, microgreens because that's a product, a produce that we can fairly easily produce. It's fast. And right now is there's a lot of request from high-end restaurants in Madrid that we want that product. And with that product solves one of the major issues is that the price of, you know, lettuce, for example, here in Madrid is, is very cheap. So starting to produce that type of products will get us in a big bind because we will not be able to produce at the cost that you can sell. So that's why we decided to use or start with microgreens first. And all the, what technology are you using to grow this? Is this all created in-house or are you partnering with other suppliers for building the farms? We're partnering with several suppliers. And uh, right now we're discussing with a couple of different producers or hardware. I call them hardware. You know, they're producing all the vertical farming hardware that we need. Cultivate is helping us also choose the right partner for the right products that we want to produce. And Additionally, we have certain requirements. I call it a box theory. And here is, I usually use the thermal mix theory. I say, you know, I'm a terrible cook. I can't cook. But if I go into the kitchen with a thermal mix, which is a robot, a cooking robot, and I follow the recipe straight 
off the line, I always get a good results. So this is the same concept that we want to apply. We're thinking of a box that it's closed, it's totally controlled uh, environment in the box. So our urban farmers separately could have their own boxes and uh, they can cultivate on a separate mode and they could put the recipes depending on what they're cultivating in each one of the controlled environments. So this is why we're right now concentrating on boxes that are totally separate from one another and that could be completely controlled environment. These boxes are two by two, so they're quite big, but they're not as big as a container. And the main reason why we're not going with containers is because here in, in Spain, and I guess in all of Europe, the cities are more constrained than in the US. So putting a container anywhere will probably not the best option, even though we can still use containers in certain places. And two by two, two meters by two meters? Yes, two meters by two meters. And are any of the farms functional yet? Are they started producing? No, we started with a minimal viable product that we've produced ourselves in different places. And now we're working on the construction of the final or the first co-working, vertical farming co-working in Madrid. It's about 400 square meters and uh, it will have the capability of doing all, all four areas that we think are essential. The first area is the production where we will have the boxes. Another area for the microgreens to start up the harmonization chamber. Another for actually packaging. During, in the same place, by the way, we do have a solar system, solar panels prepared for that. And we also have an electronic vehicle that the urban farmers can share to actually distribute their produce. And we have a small area for office space and general training, whatever you need in that area. So it has all these different areas. Even though it's 400 square meters, which is quite small, it has a lot of space and it's also very tall. So we can go with about five meters tall shelves. And so talk to me a little bit, Marcos, about the plan for the farmers. Do they come experienced or, you know, because a lot of the times, you know, as you're familiar with conversations I've had on the show, you know, there's, there's a wide range of companies that are just getting started, have a product in place, and obviously the big companies that have gotten proper funding. So I'm, I'm curious, and I'm always, I like to share stories of, of folks that are just getting started in this space because there's, there are certain challenges for first-time farmers, especially when it comes to considerations around what equipment to use, what prop to raise, and how to market and how to build those relationships with, in your case, you know, the restaurants. So I'm curious if we could just kind of dig a little deep into that because I know some listeners are just getting started and they're curious about all the moving parts and which one is more important to get in place first. And obviously from having returned from indoor agcon, it's clear, you know, for smaller farms, it's really important to have those agreements in place almost before you grow, because obviously, you know, the biggest challenge is to grow something and then not have anywhere to, to sell it. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Okay. The first thing is, um, when we talk about this theory of the Thermomix robot, the same thing we want to apply to the produce that we start producing initially. And that is, we need to have produce that have been well tested in the technology that we're using and with the right recipe. What we want to do at first, and while we train the vertical farmers, is to have the production area Practically only the manager of the co-working is the only person that will be able to go back there. And, you know, our boxes are set up so that with a small trolley, you can grab a box and take it to the manipulation area. So in this sense, there's not a lot of people handling and not a lot of opportunities of getting the area contaminated or to mess up with anything. I mean, obviously we're gonna have cameras and monitoring devices so that if there is any problem, you can grab the box that has the problem, take it out, fix it. Even, you know, if, if it has to be disposed of, it's only that one box. It's not the entire production in the whole of the production area. So in this case, what we plan to do is have very simple, and I, I know that when you're, when we're talking about all these types of of uh, produce and all these type of plants, they're life plants and they could come up with different uh, problems. But in general, 
they're all tested with the right recipe and the right seeds. And if you put those in the, the box, it should always work or most of the time. And whenever there is a problem, we will have you know, the, the procedures to find out what the problem is. But in general, you have a box, you have a recipe, and that should not go wrong. It should go out. And then the urban farmer will grab it and distribute it to his client. What we figured, and, and uh, this is why we're choosing people that already have business agreements with local restaurants, is for them to already have this relationship with the restaurants, and that's why they're going to be selling directly to them. We've also contacted several different distributors that are already distributing in high-end restaurants in Madrid, and those are also options that we can use to distribute more produce if we don't have enough with the people that with the urban farmers that we've selected initially. So those two areas, basically trying to control absolutely the entire process without having too many hands messing around with the produce. And uh, lastly, already with, with agreements with local uh, entities. I know this for for a start is something that might work initially, but obviously in the long run, if we don't have all the applications and all the procedures and all the platforms ready to connect the consumer with the producer, that's not going to be enough what we're doing initially. But it is, if it does work initially, it's going to be a great takeoff with uh, microgreens in, in Madrid. The farmers that you're working with, is, are they first-time farmers or do they have experience with vertical farming previously? No, no experience with vertical farming, but they do have with uh, produce handling. So they have been distributing produce locally, but not producing, no. That's why we're going to have a manager in the co-working area that's going to be the expert in hydroponics and, and uh, the expert in management of the crops. And do the farmers, do they have a percentage ownership of their box or do they, do they own it completely or talk a little bit about the business agreement with those farmers and how they come on board? Okay, the business model, we're still working on the details, but in general, we've got a company that's a finance company that will actually rent out with a, a leasing plan the box to each farmer. So the farmer will pay an amount for the box on a monthly basis. He will pay for the co-working space on the monthly basis based also on the amount of produce that he produces on the box, because that includes the water, includes the electricity, even the sharing of the electrical vehicle. So with a monthly uh, payment, the urban farmer will be able to have, you know, we figured that in one of these boxes, you can produce up to five tons of microgreens per year. And the price that it's sold right now goes anywhere from 20 euros to about 60 and in some cases higher for kilo. So that means that with one box, you can be not earning, but producing. Yeah, producing about 100,000 euros a year, out of which, you know, only about 20 or 30,000 is cost between the leasing of, of the machinery and the leasing of the co working space. So there's still a big margin. And obviously, again, that's why we chose microgreens initially, and we know this is not uh, a scalable and completely transferable to other produce, but it does seem like prices are going up for all of the products that we can produce, from leafy greens to uh, herbs, and everything seems to be on the, on the right track. But it is true that starting off, if you don't have a big margin produce, you will probably face you know, a lot of urban farmers that will not make ends meet and it will not be a, a good choice for them. So even if we start with 10 urban farmers in Madrid, that only those 10 can make a good living, that's what we want to start. And then we'll see how that works out in producing either other produce or going into different cities and doing the same thing if it does work out uh, good. I'm curious for these farmers, since it's their first time 
in this space as a vertical farmer, how much help or training is going to be provided in terms of how they can best build those relationships with these restaurants or with the people who are going to be buying these microgreens? Because it's obviously something that's very interesting for a lot of folks that are just getting started, not only to, to see if it makes sense financially, and, and obviously you've outlined a little bit of that, which I think is helpful, but also understanding how much work they have to, they're responsible to continue to put in to build those relationships, to maintain those relationships. Because essentially now that relationship with the restaurant or or the market is really important for them because if they can continue to produce, you know, they want to make sure that they continue to have someone to buy it from them. Yes, that's very interesting. And even on the far side of what you're just saying, imagine if that relationship with the restaurants could be so tight as to say, Okay, what type of microgreens do you want? I can produce these types of microgreens. Do you want some of this so that the restaurant feels like they can invent a new menu based on you know what this uh, farmer is giving him? And also teaching them how to sell that this is a not only a local product produced within you know the last uh, mile of them but also the freshest and personalized for the restaurant themselves, right? Yeah. So all this, together with the fact that 10 urban farmers that we're choosing right now already come from the distribution side and they already have some of the relationships and they already have some of the commercial know-how of how to sell. Maybe this type of product is something that we have to specifically teach them how to get the best value of that. We're also working with the city of Madrid and also the city of Malaga, which I was telling you about earlier. And um, what we want to do with the cities is, you know, we already have this know-how of working with co-working areas, the vertical farming co-workings of, of Madrid. The cities already are setting up co-workings for other startups and other verticals in the arena. They right now don't know much about vertical farming, but when we're talking to them, they're very interesting about this because not only does it provide an opportunity to produce in the city, to produce food that you're producing in the city, but also you have the opportunity of training people that are in different types of, you know, they either are unemployed or they have certain discapacity or whatever it is. And this type of work is available for everybody, including, you know, people on a wheelchair. We have the area prepared for all types of people to come in and to produce and to, to sell. This is very interesting for the cities. And what we're offering the cities and other institutions is, you know, we already have the know-how of doing this. We can build it for you. We can build you a co-working, a vertical farming co-working in your in your city or in your vicinity so that you can also take advantage of those opportunities. And uh, EC Farmer will actually be selling the training, the the seeds, the you know the general supplies for that uh, co-working in whatever area. But uh, what we want to create is a network of urban farmers distributed throughout the cities. And we figured that doing the, this co-working areas is the easiest way to control the production in all the, its facets. So talk to me about timeline. Where are you now with the farms in terms of like up and running? Are the contracts in place? Are all the farmers on board? And what's the roadmap look like for like the next six months? Well, it's been uh, tough because as you know, as starting any business, you have a whole bunch of different problems. But... Right now, we already have the uh, warehouse in Madrid. We already have some minor production, and we're in the midst of closing the agreements with the hardware companies, with the finance companies, and with uh, even some of the urban farmers that we already contacted, but uh, they, they, they we're still not working because we're still under construction of the first co-working area in Madrid. The productions that we've been doing in other places, we're all bringing it right into the warehouse of Madrid. And uh, we're going to be starting before the summer on the whole co-working area in Madrid. So that's 
also why we're looking for finance and we're doing a round to, for investors to raise about 500,000 euros that we need to finalize the, the first co-working in Madrid. And what's been the response or the support from the city? Well, in politics, it's very difficult because um, right now, Spain in general is very hectic. We got elections coming up in, in May, and the whole uh, political arena is very convulsive. But in Malaga, for example, we're advancing tremendously with them, not only because, like I told you, they're aiming for the expo of the International Expo of 2027, which makes them very proactive to getting this type of co workings in the city active. So, uh, and they're also very active in general co workings in the cities. So, the cities are, I think they're going to come around, even though I, for EC Farmer, does not want to depend absolutely on the cities and what they can, uh, the contracts that they can close with us. Yeah. And so, where do you see that the most challenges for you in terms of next steps and given the climate, the current climate for, you know, the support from the city? Well, obviously, the biggest challenge is what you said, uh, basically, is training the urban farmers and making sure that uh, the produce is high quality and comes out with the help of all these urban farmers, local urban farmers. So that's going to be the big, big, big challenge. Yeah, I didn't tell you, but I was also in the U.S. Army. And, uh, you know, that SOP that you have to follow and to have a strict control of what's going on in the farms. Well, that is a, a challenge that we're working on and we want uh, to make sure that our co-working areas and our co-work and our production areas are completely controlled in all its ways. So that is obviously the biggest challenge that we're going to be finding in the next uh, near future. Yeah, I think what's been consistent and from the, all the conversations I had, both at the conferences and on this show, is the importance of standardization because when, when you talk about wanting to produce a consistent product and having your buyers be comfortable that what they're going to be getting every single every single crop is going to be consistent with what they expected from you and the only way to do that is with standard operating procedures with sops to make sure that there's everything clear all along the path so the fact that you're doing that and thinking about that from day one i think is really important where else do you see opportunities in Spain or, you know, I'm just curious how you, you ended up here. You know, with, I'm, obviously, you've got the entrepreneurial mindset, but I'm curious, you know, where you're seeing opportunities and how much of this is your initial focus right now? Well, the big opportunity, obviously, is to scale it in different cities and in different places. Actually, this type of system will actually work anywhere where the, there is a demand for these type of products. So obviously, once we get that going, I think it's just a matter of scaling it city by city and uh, figuring out how to do the right scale of the co-working areas throughout the city. I'm thinking that we're going to need a major, not production area, but yes, a major big area where we can produce enough to also support the urban farmers in different places where they might not be able to produce the right varieties and the, the way to fill the demand. So yeah, the big challenge would be what is the right scale and what is the right number of co-working areas and where and what to produce inside. And obviously I'm thinking of that, we'll come up with big data and once we get all the software in place, we'll be able to know exactly where to produce and how to do that last mile distribution the best possible way so that the, you have the products that you need at the place that you need it at the right time in place. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, we talked a little bit about your journey and how you got here, but why is this initiative now like so important for you? Well, like I said, I've been uh, starting for a long time. I've been starting startups since uh, I can remember. And it's always been, like I said, in the sharing economy and empowering the user. In my case, in the internet, it was always about the user. And now I think that the most important thing 
is feeding each other, right? Yeah. It's feeding the global population and the, the growing population. So it's not a matter of competing or disrupting any one industry. It's a matter that we all have to come together to feed the world and to have a different way, you know? And one thing that I always thought about this is uh, as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking of pivoting in one case and always you have in the back of your mind, you know, what if, what's plan B? And in this case, plan C or D is that I'll never go hungry again. I'll always have food. You know, I'll always be able to produce my own food. And uh, also healthy food. So in general, I think this is the uh, right solution. A lot of times I've, I've started companies that are ahead of its times. You know, I've always started companies that were way ahead of, the, of its times. And then some other company that does exactly the same comes five or six years later and they, they totally crush it. In this case, I think... Even though in Spain, we're, there's only three or four vertical farming companies, but they're all going to, going to work and going to work right because you're producing food that people need and it's obviously going to work. I mean, I think that's not a question. Well, I mean, I think it's uh, important to also talk about all the different opportunities that exist and all the different ways people are entering the space. And obviously people that come from farming backgrounds, people that come from entrepreneurial backgrounds, technology backgrounds. I think everyone has that passion for figuring out the problems for access to fresh food. You know, this I talked a little bit about in my latest newsletter about food deserts and how these, you know, low-income neighborhoods traditionally have not had access to food. And I'm sure that's a, a challenge across the world as well. So I think it's one of those things that where I, I feel like every little bit is going to help and is needed. And so I'm glad that we get to share some of these early stories as well so that everyone knows, you know, the you know people who are interested in getting started are going to want to hear updates. And so I invite them to connect with you because they're going to want to know if you succeeded, right? Yeah. <laughs> they're going to see, they understand now the challenges that you face, the plan that you're taking, the focus on microgreens. And then, you know, the fact that you have to train these farmers and create these new positions. And so there's a lot on your plate. <laughs> it sounds like you've got a lot to take care of, but I think if you can make it succeed, it's going to be good for the city and also good for you know, sharing the stories of successful farms, which I think is really important. Correct, correct. And so I like to leave always a little bit of time at the end of the interviews for any message you have or any ask that you have of people and your colleagues in the vertical farming space. I know this is something that's relatively new for you, but I'm curious if there's anything that comes to mind for you. Well, obviously what, what we mostly need right now is urban farmers that help us uh, produce, but I would like to ask and take advantage of your position in asking two things. One is for people to vote for Malaga for the expo, not Minneapolis. Yeah. <laughs> Just joking. No, I'm, <laughs> that's, that's okay. I don't, I don't have any <laughs> strong feelings about it. You know, whoever is the right one to win, I think should win. So No, but one thing that I really want to ask from your platform is right now I'm looking for capital from investors and I'm seeing all the Spanish investors and the ones that I'm uh, most typically involved with are, you know, digital startups and all those type of investors, which is fine. And I'm finding that uh, a lot of people are interested and I'm sure it's going to work, but I would like to do my pitch to some international investors. So this is an, a great opportunity to ask for international investors that might want to get involved with uh, a vertical farming company directly in Spain. This is a good opportunity for us to get to know each other and, you know, look me up uh, via LinkedIn so that, that I can uh, do the pitch on an international level. I'm hoping for something to come out of that, whether it's uh, the providers or distributors or there's a whole world to be discovered. And my idea of, of, of uh, escalating with co-working areas, I think is something that could be used just about anywhere in the world. Yeah, I agree. Well, thanks for making that, that pitch. And obviously, if any, anyone's listening, what we'll do is make sure we have your contact information. I'll include your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. 
The website is EC Farmer. That's I S I Farmer.com. Any other sites you want to, or places you want to point people to? No, that's it. EC Farmer is um, EC. It's obviously spelled I S I uh, Farmer. And it actually comes from uh, Isidro, San Isidro, which is the saint of all farmers. So oh, um, nice. <laughs> when we decided on the name, it was easy because easy is a San Isidro Labrador, which is in, in, in Spanish, uh, the farmer. And, um, and he's a saint of all farmers worldwide. So that's also, uh, you know, it's not something that it's completely Spanish. It's very international. Isidro Labrador, it's an easy farmer. Also, you know, it reminds you of easy farming, which is also part of our objective. So that makes it all, uh, you know, the name has a meaning. Yeah, I think it's, and that's something that I didn't know. And it's nice to know that there is a patron saint of farmers, which is uh, something every little bit helps, even if it's a blessing from uh, the saint of all farmers. And I think that's helpful to know. And, and, and thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I know that your Latin background so uh, the, the saying goes, San Isidro Labrador, quita el agua y pon el sol. So it's uh, saying, you know, take the water, which makes sense right now. We're using a lot less water. And uh, we're still using the sun because we're using the solar panels. So it makes a lot of sense, all these things. And we're actually going back to basics also and trying to get, uh, you know, the urban farmers to distribute locally which is kind of reminds you of our ancestors, the way they, they produced and they fed their neighbors and, and that type of last mile distribution, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, I applaud all the work that you're doing because I know it's not easy, especially from a, as a fellow entrepreneur. And in this environment, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that you have to keep an eye on to, to make sure that this, is, this succeeds. So I'm wishing you success and just you know, keep us updated on the progress. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you for your time, Marcos. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks again to Marcos for coming on the show and sharing his story. As always, full show notes available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Special thanks to our Season 8 title sponsor, Cultivated. If you are looking into a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com, and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Learn more at fullcast.co. And specifically, take a look at our video, The Five Pillars You Need Before Launching a Successful Podcast for Your Business. As a reminder, if you are enjoying this show or you have enjoyed this show or past episodes, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. We'll be sure to read those out on future episodes, I promise. Tune in next episode for a conversation with another fascinating leader from the world of vertical farming. This time, it's Jonathan Murray from adapt.ag. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.